Don, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, boy, I think the best place for us to start, Don, is by giving everybody a little bit of context because the more they understand about you and the more they understand the nature of Soros Fund Management as an organization, the better they'll understand and appreciate uh, how you look at the world and the importance or not of the things <laughs> that you say. Um, I think of your job as pretty unique, right? You have uh, a lot of freedom. You can be highly opportunistic. You can be utterly unconstrained uh, in the investment decisions that you make. Highly unusual uh, for a pool of capital as large as yours, right? In the order of 30, 30 billion dollars? Just shy of that. Just shy. Uh, it enables you to respond immediately and to pounce on market dislocations. And as I understand it, that's why you're always studying, right, the market for potential cause and effect scenarios. Is that right? That, that, that's right. We have a really open investment mandate. So we have one team, one pool of capital, really one sophisticated client. So we can move across asset classes, across liquidity in ways that I think very few other pools of capital can do. And we have a very integrated team, so we can connect a lot of dots that I think are harder for others. And in a moment of, in time like this, I think that becomes exponentially more valuable. And just to avoid any confusion, that client is George. <laughs> and, and his foundations. Um, I do want to spend a good part of our conversation talking about these scenarios, the ones that you see unfolding in the near term and maybe a little bit further out. So what excites you most right now? What are you most interested in? What do you see happening? So um, right now, the, the asset class that we think is, is, is most interesting is actually typically a boring asset class, and that's agency mortgage-backed securities. And the reason for that is... Two-thirds of out of your current holders, it's the central bank and banks have turned sellers. Um, and, and you have a d dynamic where you've had extraordinary interest rate volatility. So the, the valuations in that space have gotten, we would, we, we would say, disproportionately cheap relative to other asset classes because of those technicals. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you had, obviously, some high-profile regional bank failures where you have the FDIC auctioning off a, a good portion or, or sizable um, portfolios, and that's also adding to kind of the technical backdrop. But um, we think that asset class is, is probably uniquely interesting right now. You're not the only person to say that um, RMBS looks attractive. Um, uh, or agency, uh, you know, mortgage bonds look attractive. Uh, how long can that last? I mean, if, if everybody sees the value in that trade, surely, right, the spread has to collapse. Yeah, um, well, a couple things. First of all, when it comes to equities, I hate being in a consensus trade because you're at, at the mercy of, of the next, you know, the greater fool or the next marginal buyer. When you buy fixed income, you just have to be right because eventually you have a maturity. Um, so, the, so I think you're right. There's a lot of people who are, who are citing this asset class as cheap. Um, when something's cheap, I want to know why it's cheap. And again, there's some really clear technical reasons mm -hmm. why this asset class um, is cheap. And by the way, I think you're going to see more bank failures, likely in the small banks. So it's not going to be the big headlines and the size of the failures we had so far. But I think there's more problems under the surface, so you'll, you'll see um, continued sales. And the other thing that, that is, is um, you know, undeniable is, a, in aggregate, banks have to reduce balance sheets and shorten duration of portfolios here. There is um, you know, regulation coming mm. um, that's going to be pretty punitive. Talk a bit more about that. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the Federal Reserve has, has said they're doing a comprehensive over review of bank regulation. I think what that's going to look like is enhanced stress test. Um, AOIC exemptions, I think, are going to disappear. That's where people didn't have to mark things to market. Um, I think when it comes to liquidity management, um, there's going to be a lot more scrutiny on that. One of the interesting things is coming out of the financial crisis, there was a lot of focus on asset quality, so things like stress tests, and not as much 
on liability management. But now we know, like, you know, deposit assumptions were just wrong. And, and by the way, we, we, um, I won't net mention the name, but a, a bank yesterday said they lost one of their big, biggest depositors because another bank was paying Fed funds plus 70 basis points for deposits. Like, that's not a healthy backdrop. And by the way, part of the reason they can do that is because you have a quasi-government guarantee right now on bank deposits. So in addition to agency mortgage bonds, what, what other kinds of trades and or investments seem attractive to you with that as the backdrop? So we're, fi so we're finally, with that as the backdrop, you are seeing a credit contraction. I think you know, the, the recent loan data you know, doesn't it actually surprise a little bit better to the upside, but this contraction is invariably coming. Um, you, you, banks will just be able to loan less. Um, in the levered loan space, 70% of levered loans have been bought recently by CLOs. CLO issuance right now is at 2020 levels. And also, typically, um, CLOs have a reset where they can extend duration. But this is another like unintended consequences of higher rates. Now, with higher rates, those resets don't make ec economic sense. So you have 40% of existing CLOs ending their reinvestment periods by the end of this year. Um, so you're just going to have less loan, I, less credit available. And there's a lot of people who think, ah, private credit has grown exponentially. They'll just fill in the gap. I, I, I think that's, that's not, not going to prove to be quite accurate. They can do more than they could have done 10 years ago, but it's too big a gap to fill in. So in private credit, we're finally seeing things begin to reprice. Um, and, and I think you are going to see a default cycle that's, that is about to kind of emerge. And I think the magnitude and probably more interesting, the duration of that default cycle is going to surprise people. How do we see that play out then? There's clearly a bond market, there's a leveraged loan market, but there isn't much of a secondary market for things like the unit tranche loans that have been, you know, that, that, that lately have been dominating the growth of the private credit market. Yeah, so I, I, again, I think private credit firms are all opportunistically trying to raise capital. Um, I think when you look at alternative asset management capital raises, they're generally challenged. Maybe private credit is a little less challenged than other areas, but they're all challenged. Um, I think in the private credit world, one of the things you're going to see is the most vulnerable loans are going to be the ones that private equity took out, so sponsor loans. And I think you're going to see those private equity companies be really aggressive around liquidity and maturity issues. So I think you're going to see a lot of kind of extend and pretend. And that also reduces the amount of real dry powder out there. For you, is this just a matter of waiting for the things that, that you find interesting to get cheap enough? Or are, you, are there opportunities to short along the way? Yeah, so right now, our balance sheet is really clean. And one of the things I've been stressing to the team is it is a little bit about being patient. And I think sometimes that's something that investors do poorly, both institutional and retail, um, is, is just be patient and let the opportunity set come to you. I, again, I think where we're headed, in some ways, um, the great financial crisis and COVID were, were not that painful, right? Because they were really deep um, corrections and, and really quick recoveries. I think this is set up for something that's going to take a really long time to play through. Um, I think there's a lot of private equity and, and borrowers and people who own big buildings who are betting rates come down quickly. And that, I just don't, I don't see that happening. Do you not see it happening with enough conviction that you're willing to take the other side of the rate trade? Uh, we, 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 have, we have that bet on in rates for sure. And I think one of the 
like one of the things that's that's so different about this time is you had central banks and and fiscal authorities throw everything their entire financial crisis playbook plus six trillion dollars at the pandemic recession in hindsight it was too much and it caused just overly abundant credit and asset inflation and the workout on the other side is just going to take a really long time and what we see is is you still have a lot of underlying distortions so so like within sectors you have like boom bust cycles so at the surface things look good but below the surface like all hell is break, breaking breaking out but think about that that's going to make the fed's job really really difficult and and you could have a really big default cycle without gdp rolling over much of this don as you just alluded is the consequence of policy making uh, both at the fiscal and monetary level how much confidence do you have in market regulation right now um when so you see what's going on in crypto for example over the past couple of days and folks i think you're going to hear a little more about that in a few minutes yeah um but also in antitrust yep um you mentioned banking yeah so um i will start start with with crypto which always gets me into trouble but um <laughs> but i think you know especially the headlines of the last couple of days it's clear these crypto native um platforms would have benefited from having an adult in the room there <laughs> 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 Somebody might have something to say about that. <laughs> to, say, to state the obvious, um, but 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 like there are there are just long held and simple norms about how you treat customer assets. For for example, um, and what I think I, I think crypto is here to stay. I think what's what's happened is is clearly a setback. But right now, I actually think it's a huge opportunity for the incumbent financial firms. to actually take the lead the ones that are already regulated and run for example regulated exchanges yeah and know and know how to segregate client assets and 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 yeah so i i think that is is what's going to happen on kind of that might be ironic though given the disruption that crypto promised yeah there is some irony to it and i and i'm i'm sh- yeah it is it is ironic but i think that's i think that is going to be the evolution um in terms of hedge funds and private equity you know when i look like at the um financial stability oversight committee which sits on top of all of the us kind of regu- regulatory board apparatus which our us regulatory setup is is really too fractured to be wholly effective in my opinion um but when you look at what they're focused on it's clear that they know post the financial crisis because of regulation they shifted an exponential amount of risk into the non-regulated um non-banking sector and they're trying to figure out ways to to get out that cuz that is where your next next systemic risk is going to occur and their ability to spot it and course correct right now i think is pretty limited so you think see things coming out like uh the amendment to form form pf mm-hmm. um where they have to alert the SEC to so-called trigger events yeah in in very short duration i actually think 72 hours i think exactly and i think in a lot of ways that design is better than in 2011 form pf just asked for this huge data dump that candidly i'm not sure the SEC knew what to do with um so this alert system i think is 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 really interesting and 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 like elegant in, in its simplicity but i worry it will allow them to see idiosyncratic risks and probably um help 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 those but when it comes to systemic events i think they might see it but they're going to see it too late so a systemic event of 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 what nature that you know uh, the highly levered multi strategy hedge fund you know all of a sudden has serious problems Yeah, so if you look at the top 4 public market hedge funds right now, their balance sheets, their gross assets are well in excess of a trillion dollars. 
Um, and at the, again, you have your regulated dealer community where the balance sheets have done nothing but go down. Um, another, another stat that's really interesting, your publicly traded alts, assets under management, have doubled since 2020. So in other words, and, and I would argue those big multi-strategy platforms, they don't do things that are all that different from one another. So when you have an unwind of a trade, finding that marginal buyer, I think is just gonna be that much more difficult. It's one of the things um, at Soros Fund Management we think about every day in that we think, we wanna position ourselves to take advantage, advantage of those dislocations. But by the way, you saw it on the back of Silicon Valley bank failure when you had two-year treasury rates go from like, you know, above 5% to below 360. That's like a crazy enormous move for a two-year government bond. There are any number of different kinds of dislocations. We've talked about some of them, technical, structural, cyclical. There's technological too. Yep. Do you think AI is going to create market disruptions, dislocations? Um, potentially. I think, um, you know, when, when we see what's going on in AI, first of all, when you look at what, what just came out of the recent earnings report, it is clear that we're at the beginning of a mega cycle um, in, in spending in AI. And the real beneficiaries, obviously, are the applications, so your SaaS companies, and you know infrastructure, so it's it's cloud and and your you know high, high performing chip companies. Um, those stocks right now are extrapolating pretty enormous compounding growth. Um, we 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 wouldn't necessarily chase that, but but to your point, what's really striking about where we are right now is. AI allows us to talk to computers like ourselves and the ability to, to tap into massive compute power and probably even more importantly, enterprise data and just global data generally is going to be seismic and, it's, and, and, and the capabilities are just gonna be exponential. Don, last question for you. There's a long tradition of prominent investors who speak out about economic policy. <laughs> and much of the commentary we get from them, I think is genuinely altruistic, right? Out of concern for the good of the country or perhaps even the good of the world. And George Soros is near or at the top of that list. Also Stan Druckenmiller, uh, who was here earlier, who once held the role that you hold now. Uh, Ray Dalio, Ken Griffin on occasion, we get it from Warren Buffett, Bill Ackman, Paul Tudor Jones, whom you know well. They're all men. I'd love to add a woman to that list. Will it be Don Fitzpatrick? Hopefully one day. Yeah, I, 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 I um, you know, George is active and I, I think it's important that I'm deferential to him. Um, I do serve on government advisory committees, so I, I, I try to Working be- Working behind the scenes. I try to work behind the scenes, um, but yeah, one day. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Don Fitzpatrick. <laughs>